What, what are other examples in the human body that are... The most dramatic is, is the human eye. Right. You know, it's held up as this example of perfection in the body. It's not perfect at all. It's, it's a perfect example of, of why the body is not designed. I mean, imagine a camera designer for a famous camera company like Nikon or Pentax who put the wires between the light and the film, which is how our eye is working. And not only that, our eye has a whole blind spot where nothing works at all. I I think th you know, do you know that every creationist has a blind spot? <laughs> I and think it was Helmholtz, the famous German psychologist, who said if somebody, had, if an engineer had given him the human eye, he'd yeah. have sent it back. Indeed, yeah. indeed. Mm -hmm. um, I think viewers might like to see their own blind spots. Shall we demonstrate for them for just a moment? Okay. Yes. All you need um, to do the demonstration is a little pencil. You can do it just with an eraser, but this particular one has a little tiny red pin on the top. And what you do is cover one eye, if you would, please. And we take the pin and we move it right in the, and you have to keep looking right, right. at the bridge of my nose, so okay. keep your eye fixed. And now we're going to move it just out a little bit, about 15 degrees, and right about there. Yeah, it's gone. It's gone. Yeah. You can't see it? No. Now can you see it? Yes. Now can you see it? Yes. Now can you see it? No. There's a blind spot. Yeah. That's really lousy. Yeah. So what's amazing though about how natural selection has made the eye so it works despite this built-in flaw is that the eye constantly jiggles slightly. We call it nystagmus. And this seems like it's a problem, but it's actually a solution. Because if it wasn't for the eye jiggling constantly just a little bit, that blind spot would always be in the same spot. You'd never see anything there. But because the eye moves slightly, um, you end up getting a complete coverage of your field of vision. It is remarkable how natural selection manages to kind of clean up afterwards, isn't it? That's I mean, a lot of what it does. You start off it's with, stuck with things. With a, it's stuck with things for historical accident, but then the, the cleaning up afterwards is so good that it actually ends up a really remarkably fine instrument, despite it, its historical it, it's legacy. It's astounding, right. Yeah. I mean, with the eye, there are other things that happen later in life, like detached retinas, you know? Um, for us, as I said, all of the vessels and nerves come through that hole in the back of the eyeball. That's why there's a blind spot. And they spread out on the inside of the eyeball between the light and the place where the light is received, blocking the light. And that's why you have to have that little bit of jiggle in there. Uh, but that's for all mammals, in fact, all vertebrates. Not all species have this problem, interestingly. Mm -hmm. And if we can go over here to our octopus, I don't know if you can zoom in. All of the octopuses, the cephalopods, have an eye that's designed properly. There I used the design word again. Yeah. Um, their eyes have all of the vessels and nerves coming right through the back of the eyeball, so they can't get a retinal detachment. They never have a problem with the blind spot. They don't have to be moving the eye so much to get a complete field of vision. It's a better design absolutely entirely than ours. And the reason is, why are we so screwed up? Bad luck. Yeah. In There's no right other the explanation yes. except it's bad luck. Nevertheless, we probably see better than octopuses do because our cleaning up has been has Or been differently, so you know. Yes. That, that's another example of trade-offs. For instance, uh, an eagle can see a mouse from half a mile away and we can't. Yes but they don't have the color vision we have, they don't have the field of vision that we have. Everything in the body, once you take an evolutionary view, is trade-offs all the way down. As a Darwinian, I'm used to thinking of everything as being good for the body, but what about something like sneezing or vomiting? I mean, how is that? You know, there, there are two different kinds of problems people bring to their doctors. Some of them are caused directly by the disease. There's a tumor, or there's seizures, or there's the yellow color your skin turns when you get jaundice because your liver fails. Nothing good about them, they just indicate that something's wrong in the mechanism. But most of the problems that people bring to their doctors aren't actually diseases, they're the body's protection against something going wrong. What you mentioned sneezes, fever, cough, vomiting, fatigue, anxiety, diarrhea. All of those things, nasty as they are, are useful. Otherwise, they wouldn't be there. How about a life without pain? Wouldn't that be great? Go on. <laughs> well, you can guess that because we have this capacity for pain, it wouldn't be there. It would be good for something. Yes. Mm -hmm. And indeed, there are a few very unfortunate people who are born with no capacity for pain. They're almost all dead by early adulthood. What kills them? It turns out that most of us don't stand still like this. We wiggle a little bit. Mm -hmm. And we can't sit still because we wiggle. They have no pain standing still, so their joints deteriorate and they get sores on their skin from not moving. And of course, if they get appendicitis or something like that, they never know it. And so they're really prone to bad things happening. Pain, when you experience it, means there's something going wrong, but the, the capacity for pain 
is absolutely essential. Well, if I came to you and um, said, Doctor, I've got a terribly high temperature, yes. please give me a drug to bring the temperature down. I mean, what, what would you say to that? You know, people want an easy answer to that question, and it's terribly important not to give one. I had a dear friend once who called from a hospital bed saying, I have a high temperature, the doctors want to give me something, but I know that fever is useful, therefore I won't reduce my fever. But we have to think as evolutionists about how fever is controlled and how it's useful. So if I understand you right, something like a fever, a high temperature, might actually not be a bad thing, it might actually be a good thing because it might be making life difficult for some bacteria, say. Exactly so. Uh, the best experience of, experiments have been done on lizards, not people. Um, and if you give them an infection, they crawl close to a light bulb and create an artificial fever in themselves, which decreases their death rate a lot. Right, and lizards uh, normally control their temperature, not in the way we do internally. They normally control it by moving into the sun. So that's, that's right. what they're using that to create an artificial fever. And it works. I continue to be amazed that we don't really know the answer to whether we should reduce fever in everyday colds oh, and Oh, so if, if I came to you as a doctor and said, I've got a fever, please give me a drug to bring it down, you might not immediately say, no, I won't. You might actually say, we've got to think Let's about think. that. Let's think. Actually, yeah, okay. thank you so much. That's exactly the right attitude to evolutionary medicine. Right. Um, some people imagine that it tells you how to practice. It does not. It tells you what questions to ask and what studies need to be done. And these studies, even though we've known they need to be done for quite a long time now, have not been done properly. So fever is certainly useful, but if it's so useful, then how is general medicine possible? Because a lot of what general medicine does is block perfectly normal defenses. Fever, pain, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, cough. Um, doctors are very good at relieving the suffering associated with those things. And when I first realized that these were all useful defenses, I wondered, what are we doing to our patients? Are we hurting them somehow? Or maybe natural selection just isn't that clever. What's, what's going on here? And it finally dawned on me that every day when I made toast in the morning, my smoke detector went off and I put up with it. And the reason I put up with it is that the cost of a false alarm in a smoke detector is not much. But I want my smoke detector to go off every single time there's a fire. I don't want it to go off half of the time when there's a big fire. And so the principle here is, so take something like vomiting, unpleasant to talk about, but what happens is you might cost you about 200 calories. But not vomiting, if you have a potentially fatal illness, is going to kill you. And therefore, the normal system is set by what we call the smoke detector principle to express these painful defenses much more often than they're needed. Because uh, there's a kind of asymmetry of risk. That's, that's exactly yes. the right way of putting it. Right. Yes, it's quite asymmetrical. And this means that it's safe to block cough, fever, vomiting, much of the time, except for the times when it's not safe. Yes. And I think the next phase of, of understanding these things in general medicine is going to be making sharper distinctions about when it's safe and when it's not. Now, in fact, many doctors know all about most of this already. If you've just had surgery, uh, your doctor will tell you, please cough. And you'll say, I don't want to cough, it hurts. And the doctor will say, cough anyhow. If you don't cough, you'll probably get pneumonia. So doctors are quite onto this, and they won't give you codeine uh, to completely block your cough if you have pneumonia, because they want you to use a normal protective response. Um, but much more work needs to be done in this and can be done quite quickly. Right.